Chapter 6 discusses behavior modeling. And um, behavior models describe what's actually happening inside the system. And there are several types. So there are interaction diagrams, which are either sequence or communication diagrams. And um, what they do is they show that objects collaborate to provide the functionality defined in the use cases. So it really combines the object, the classes that we've defined in the analysis class diagram with the use cases and said, OK, well, this is what the user wants to do. And then what has to happen inside the system using the objects that we can create from our class diagram? And how do they collaborate to show what actually happens? And then there's also behavior state machines, which show the changes in the data. So of these diagrams in Chapter 6, we are going to focus on the sequence diagram. What behavior models do is they allow the analyst uh, to view the problem, again, using the use cases, and then how it's supported by the collaborating objects. So this aids in the organization and defining of the software. It helps us understand how to develop the software. We are not focused at this point on writing the software, right? This is still analysis. So we're not doing implementation, but we're starting to understand how the objects are going to interact inside the system. So part of that is going to be identifying the objects. And an object is simply an instantiation of a class. So if we have a patient class, that would be defined in the analysis class diagram. Then an object, for example, Mary Wilson, is a single instantiation of that class. So it's a single patient object. And so we need to understand objects. Uh, and we'll be using objects in the sequence diagram. Then messages, here's messages or information sent to objects to tell them to execute one of their behaviors. What this really is, is a function call from one object to another. So it's important to understand that this is a new term, message, that really refers to an old concept, a function call. So we want to understand that that's what's happening. And again, there's two different types of interaction diagrams, the sequence diagram and the communication diagram. And we're going to focus on the sequence diagram. And uh, they actually illustrate, sequence diagrams illustrate the objects and how they participate in a single use case scenario. And it's a dynamic model, so it shows the sequence of messages as they pass between the different objects. And it helps us under, better understand the system. Here are the, ob, the items that you can use on a sequence diagram. So you can have an actor, either a human actor that's external to the system, or a non-human actor, such as an authentication system, or a database system that's external to the system. So in either case, actors are external to the system, but they interact with the system. And so we represent them and show those the interactions that they have. We have an object that has a name, and then colon, and then the name of the class. And so these are specific instantiation of a class object. And then a lifeline. And the lifeline goes from when the class begins or when the object begins for as long as its life lasts. And execution occurrence goes on the lifeline, and it shows when an object is interacting with a message, either sending or receiving messages. Here's how you draw a message. It's a solid line with the function call as the label. A return value is shown with a dotted line, and it has the value that's being returned as the label. Notice these can go in either direction. So they're shown this way, but messages can go in either direction. Uh, but the arrowhead indicates where the message is, where the function call is initiated, and where it's being sent. You can add a guard condition on a message that would limit it, say it would not be, that message would not be sent until this guard condition is met. And an X would go at the bottom of a lifeline. Remember the lifeline is the dotted line. It would go at the end of a dotted line when, and this would indicate that an object is going out of existence so that it no longer exists. So the object itself is being destroyed.
A frame is sets the context of the sequence diagram. Here's an example sequence diagram. And what you see is an actor and some objects. Now notice how these objects are not named. And that uh, often objects are not named if there's only one object in the entire diagram. The times that you do name it is when you have um, an internal representation of an external actor. So if I had a client and I had a client represented in the system, I would give them both the same name so I could recognize that that external actor is being represented internally by that object. Uh, the other time that you would name it is if you have multiple objects of the same type. But very common not to include the name on an object. So you see these messages being sent, you see return values being returned, um, and so you see, and you see them going both directions. Another thing you see here is an object not across the top. And that is because this object actually did not exist when the, when the scenario started. And so what will be across the top are any objects that existed when the scenario started. And these would be limited to objects that are actually engaged in the sequence diagram. So this means that this object was created at this point in the scenario, right? In the sequence diagram happens from top to bottom in time and as much as possible from left to right. Here's the process for building a sequence diagram. First you set the context. This is to really define the use case scenario that's going to be demonstrated in the particular sequence diagram. Once you've created that, you identify the actors and objects that are going to be interacting in this scenario. Then set the lifelines and add any messages by drawing message um, lines with labels of the function call. And you include any parameters in parentheses. And then also add any return lines when there are values to be returned from the message call. Then you add the execution occurrence, so to show when each, on each object's lifeline when it's interacting. And then the final thing is to validate the sequence diagram. And here you verify that all the steps in the process have been included in the sequence diagram. And that's an overview of sequence diagrams. We're going to come back and show each of these steps individually.